Good evening. I would like to call the January 12, 2016 meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals to order. F first uh, item up is the election of officers. Is there a nomination for chairman? There is a nomination. Is there a second? No, I, I want to nominate somebody. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I want to nominate Joe Trizola. Is there a second? I'd like to second. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, uh, let's have a vote. Mr. Soda. With the motion. Mr. Vecino. With the motion. Mr. Haberman. With the motion. Ms. Fronte. With the motion. Mr. Dubois. With the motion. And Mr. Thomas. With the motion. Uh, Mr. Tuzola, you, you're up again. First off, thank you, board, for uh, asking me to again represent you as chairman. It's my privilege to do that and serve on this board. It's uh, such a great board of servants for the city. Uh, next item would be um, nominations for secretary, and I would like to nominate Howard Haberman. Second. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Okay, nominations are closed. Mr. Haberman? Uh, Mr. Soda, vote please. Uh, with the motion. Mr. Ficino? With the motion. I'm with the motion. Mr. Ferrante? With the motion. Mr. Dubois? I'm with the motion. Mr. Thomas? I am with the motion as well. Mr. Mr. Haberman is our secretary. Thank you. As mentioned, this is the Zoning Board of Appeals January 2016 meeting. Uh, please stand for the, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Okay, we need an official roll call. Okay. Uh, Mr. Tuzola. Here. Mr. Haberman. Here. Mr. Vecino. Here. Mr. Soda. Here. Mr. Dubois. Here. Ms. Ferrante. Here. Mr. Thomas. Here. Thank you. Also present, Meg Green, our recording secretary. Um, Stephen Harris, our zoning officer. If anyone feels that there's a commissioner on this board that would be a conflict of interest to their application, please let us know. Otherwise, um, Mr. Hapman. Item number one, continued 108 Beach Avenue, zone R75, Charles Willinger, Esquire, attorney for uh, lead in consulting corporation, owner uh, section 9-2-1, appealed the decision of zoning enforcement officer in a letter re uh, regarding a variance to install a fence dated 3 September 2015, map 60, block 743, parcel 2. Mr. Chairman, there, there has been an update. I would like to uh, read a letter uh, into the record. This is a letter from myself to uh, Charles Willinger, Jr. at Willinger, Willinger and Bucci PC, 855 Main Street, 5th floor, Bridgeport, Connecticut. And it concerns the proposed fence and signs on land known as 108 Beach Avenue, Parcel 2, Milford. The letter reads, Dear Mr. Willinger, at a meeting on 1816 held in the office of the director of DPLU, which included you, myself, and Director Griffith, I agreed to withdraw my decision dated September 3rd, 2015, concerning the requirement to obtain a variance to install a fence on land known as Parcel 2, and you agreed to lower the height of the fence to 2 foot 11 inches. 
The matter concerning multiple signs is separate and will be heard by the Zoning Board of Appeals at the January 12, 2016 meeting. By this letter, I am withdrawing my decision dated 9-3-15 concerning the construction of a fence. My decision that a variance is required for multiple signs is still in effect. Construction plans for the fence shall be submitted to the Planning and Zoning Office for inclusion in the file showing it to have a height of no more than 2 foot 11 inches. So the, uh, the, the issue uh, concerning the appeal now is moot. Like to, okay, so, like to so, confirm if, if so item Wilinger. number one on the agenda is settled. Right, and, and I will just, just for the record, Mr. Chairman, as Attorney Willinger, for the record, uh, in light of that letter that you uh, have just heard and perhaps have a copy, we are uh, withdrawing that appeal and won't be pursuing that uh, appeal. <clears throat> item number two, though, we will pursue. Okay. Um, so we'll have no discussion as, as to why this this is okay right now, or it's just over. Uh, because the height of the fence was lowered below the three foot threshold, there is no longer a variance required to put this fence up. So since the fence doesn't meet the threshold of requiring variance, the appeal was withdrawn and the issue's moot. Do we, what we were looking for was proof of ownership on, on the property. Has that been established? The ownership has been, has been satisfied to, to my satisfaction. Uh, Mr. Willinger, last month, you may remember, submitted a list of deeds showing chain of title. I reviewed that and it is indeed, in my opinion, uh, a parcel that has been conveyed um, since 1900. Thank you. We should move on to item number two. Item number two, continued, 108 Beach Avenue, zone R75, Charles Willinger, Esquire Attorney for Leading Consulting Corporation, owner section 5-3-4-1, uh, very uh, north and location of signs, oh, number and location of signs, uh, sections 5.8 vary flood hazard area, section 4-1-7-3, vary installation of fence, map 60, block 743, parcel 2. Go ahead, Mr. Willinger. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the commission and staff, good evening. My name is Charles Willinger, attorney of uh, and a partner of Willinger, Willinger and Busey, representing the petitioner. Uh, you'll recall, Mr. Chairman, that we have incorporated in uh, to uh, the December 8th hearing the testimony and evidence on the Dis uh, October 3rd uh, hearing. And uh, then on October, uh, December 8th, we were finished with our presentation uh, and Mr. Harris asked for a continuance to review uh, the title and other documents which he has, the result of which is we've uh, withdrawn the appeal. So what's left are the variances for the signage that we want to install on the premises. Uh, we had finished our presentation and you were about ready to start the opposition. So uh, I think what, unless you want to do it another way, we'll, we've rested, the records indicated, We'll hear the opposition and then I'll have a right to rebut. Unless you want me to summarize what we're doing here, however we'll handle well, it. Well, we're just talking right now. I mean, it looks like item number one is, is taken care of. So item number two oh, right. is, we're is, talking about item number is two. we're talking about variances right now. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think that's what we'll be talking about. So okay. we should move on to the and variance. The way we had left off on that is um, I had summarized our position on the, uh, not only on the, on the uh, order to comply uh, or the, or the uh, appeal from the CEO, Mr. Harris, but also on the variances. I could summarize that again, or I could rest, have the opposition rebut, and then would come up. Whatever you'd like, Mr. Um, Chairman. As I recall, we didn't talk a lot about the variance. We were, we were pretty much into the property and who owned the property. 
So the variance is you should bring that up right now and you should tell us okay. what let me, you let would me. like for a variance on, on what okay. you're looking for. Let me then, let me summarize our position. It's already been in the record, but I'd be more than happy to just uh, quickly highlight it. Uh, if you need more information, that's fine. You'll recall that we submitted this booklet, I think, I uh, hope, and it's already a, a, an exhibit in this hearing, and I hope you've all remembered uh, kind of what was in it, because this booklet <clears throat> contains, I think, everything you need to know in reference to our request for a variance. This booklet shows the, what I term the public invasion on uh, our piece of property on 108 Beach, at 108 Beach Avenue, Parcel 2. Uh, you'll recall that this booklet showed uh, evidence and pictures of semi-naked fishermen uh, on our property, of bicycle riders uh, rappelling down the rocks uh, and a very dangerous, uh, creating a very dangerous uh, condition and a liability not only for us but potentially for the uh, city. It showed people having parties and picnics with coolers, uh, camping out with tents. It showed people ordering beer and pizza for delivery, for actual delivery where they picked it up from the uh, street and went, uh, went about their business on our property. It showed walking dogs. It showed littering. It showed um, beer cans uh, being left on the property, whiskey bottles left, debris in general left on the property. Uh, we uh, submitted evidence of a, a homeless person who actually uh, built his own lean-to uh, and for a period of time was, uh, was living on the property. So all of that shows uh, an absolute need for us to advise the public that that is our property and we don't, for various reasons, the chief of which is liability, we don't want anyone trespassing on our property. To do that, we need the variances for these signs that we've requested. Uh, you have the map, you've seen the signs. It's a very nice looking sign. It's also in this book. It's a small sign, very small, uh, just saying no trespassing. It's a nautical design. If you need to review that, it's in this uh, booklet. I'll be more than happy to point, point that out again to you. In terms of the hardship, uh, this property is certainly unique. <clears throat> uh, it has those out, uh, rock outcroppings. It has the dangerous uh, slope and drop off into the water. The topography, which I just described, is, is really uh, unique. The shape and configuration of the lot, you saw it on the map, how, it, how it's configured, is certainly unique. Uh, but it's the location of this property on Long Island Sound next to a public beach that really cries out for the remedy that we seek, which is to advise the public that this is not part of public land, that this is our property. And I would point out, just for the record and for your edification, that there are Supreme Court cases, and the leading case is Blum versus ZBA, Supreme Court of Errors, that says that the location of property can be the basis of a hardship. And that, in, in addition to everything I just said about the uh, topography, the uniqueness of the parcel, its location right next to the beach, uh, a public beach, is really the essence of this hardship. Uh, in terms of this application being consistent with your comprehensive plan, I think the best evidence of that is the neighbors. Uh, because what that means, in plain English, uh, being uh, consistent with the comprehensive plan, is this a proposal that uh, is going to adversely impact the neighborhood, or is it a proposal that is supportive of the neighborhood? Uh, and um, it certainly is. We've had, except for one or two people in opposition, we had the nearly unanimous support of all of our neighbors, and we've submitted petitions. Since this is a third hearing, you know you have all that in the record already. I won't, I won't go over that again. Petitions and letters of support and so forth. So, for all those reasons, uh, from a traditional variance standpoint, we believe, with all due respect, that we 
have justification for you granting, and there's certainly a need to grant it, and hopefully uh, if you put yourself uh, in, in my client's position, if this was your property, you'd want to protect it and you would want to make sure that no one's going to be hurt and sue you. And it's really that simple. In terms of the second type of variance, that is the uh, variance for the flood damage regulations, that's 5.8 of your regulations. Uh, there is a regulation that requires us to get the variance for the signs because technically, technically, the sign is a structure. And in, uh, as, su as a structure, uh, section 5.8.4.8.2, subsection 4, would require this uh, variance. In that section, if you look at it, says that you have the power to grant this variance if you believe three things. One, if you believe that there's good and sufficient reason to grant the variance. Now, we're talking about the variance for these small one foot signs, that's all it is. So is there a reason? Yes, and the reason we just went over. Two, uh, would the granting of this variance result in increased flood heights? Now, there's, we're not gonna increase any flood heights by installing these signs. Three, would there be an additional threat to public safety or extraordinary public expense? or would it create a nuisance or cause fraud or victimization of the public, or would it conflict with existing local laws or ordinances? And it's pretty clear, and hopefully uh, you're clear on this point, none of those things are in play. Installing these small, uh, no trespassing signs, none of these issues are uh, in play. And so for all those reasons, I would respectfully suggest that we meet all legal criteria for granting uh, a variance, and hopefully you would agree and grant this variance. And now, Mr. Chairman, that pretty much summarizes our position. Subject to answering any questions of the board or rebuttal of the opposition, we would rest. Okay, thank you. Thank any, you. Any questions for Mr. Willinger? Uh, Mr. Willinger, I just have one question for you. How many signs were we talking about? I think it was seven you noted uh, at the last hearing. You know, I've got to, I'm just getting over a cold in my ears. How many uh, signs were you uh, uh, oh, planning? Oh, we're seven? for a total of six signs over the, or the entire property. And it's, uh, the locations are on the map. <clears throat> Mr. Harris, can I ask you a question? What other variants, are they allowed to post one sign, two signs, any signs on that property? One sign. One sign. How, how large could the sign be? I believe it's no higher than, I was trying to remember off the top of my head, no higher than 10 feet off the ground. A actual sign of, of the size of the sign that would be posted uh, stating why it's there. You know, I mean, would it be the size of a, uh, yeah, it's a, a no I parking can sign? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, the sign, just for your information, the sign, it's on the plans. The sign that we want is 14 inches by 12 inches. Okay. Signs allowable in a residential district can be a maximum of nine square feet in area and with a maximum of eight feet in height and not to be located not less than 10 feet from the front property line. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I do. Go ahead, Mr. Vecino. <laughs> um, this one's for Mr. Harris. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. When I read the variance request, I'm getting hung up and maybe it's just my interpretation, but I'm getting hung up on the end of the request where it says section 4.1.7.3, very installation of fence. Does that still apply? I, I don't want to approve a motion. That, that's what I see here. So I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page because that sounds like that fence part is number one, right? Right, the fe exactly. So we want to cross that off when we vote on right. this thing. The reason, uh, Mr. Commissioner, that was there is in the event uh, you would uh, you would approve Mr. Harris's yep. uh, ruling, then we would need a variance for the fence. Great. Okay. So, so we the know fence that fence is no longer in play. Okay. So we know that when we make that motion, we're going to not accept that component. 
My other questions, you mentioned, and I'm sorry, I, I have your, your um, presentation from the past, but I don't see the map where the locations of the signs are going to be. Can you point out that part, or is it on this humongous thing? That's what Mr. Soda is telling me. Right. It's on, it's on uh, that. Okay. Can you give me one sec? Thanks. And the number and the size were already mentioned. Those were my questions. Thank you, Attorney. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Soda? You know, you got the signs scattered all around the inside of the property, but why aren't you putting any by the fence? Uh, we, th we thought that the, the fence is a, a line of demarcation in itself. Okay. Okay, you all set, Mr. Soda? Anyone else speaking in favor of this application? Okay. Anyone here opposed to this application? Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Bill Coleman. I live at 20 Blackall Road in Milford. Thank you all for your service. Thank you, Mr. Harris, Ms. Green. I wanted to uh, hand out a map, if I may. Okay, um, I talked last time in my opposition about the, the spirit of this thing, and I won't get into that too much. I'll try to stick to the facts of it. I know obviously you've made some further investigations into title. Um, I'm not a title lawyer, so I'm not going to claim to be one, but there is a distinction between a warranty deed and a quick claim deed, and my understanding is that the parcel 108 Beach Street is a parcel that's been defined for some years by a warranty deed, and then this presumed, asserted parcel number two exists by virtue of a quick claim deed. Um, and that's a bit of a different standard uh, with respect to the law. Um, that that quick claim deed has transferred over the years. I understand there may have been an exception back in 1900 when it didn't get picked up at probate court, but that it has transferred is interesting, but I don't think it's determinative. Um, you know, the, the old joke about the quick claim deed is I, I'm quitting my claim. Whatever claim I may have to that property, I quit it, which is different than a warranty deed where you say, I guarantee it. So the joke is you can get a quick claim deed to the Brooklyn Bridge or property in a vacation resort, that sort of thing. Um, I'm sure Mr. Willinger will speak to those issues, but I want to put it out there. I think it's, it's, it's unfair uh, to ask the Zoning Board of Appeals, to ask the zoning staff, to get into what is a very dubious claim of ownership. And it seems to me that the petitioner is, in some senses, attempting to try title against the public on this presumed parcel two. And it seems to me to be a misuse, if not a downright abuse, of this forum to do that. There's a court across the street where you can settle these kinds of issues. For someone to come here, they really ought to have it very simply put forward before you all as to the existence of the parcel, and then the debate about zoning can flow naturally from there. You all, whatever you decide, have impressed me with your willingness to do, as, as one of the commissioners cited in the first meeting, attempt to get it right. And you all are serving the public very well by that attitude, however you decide. I do not think you're being fairly used in this, in this particular manner. Toward that end, you know, when you hear a presentation such as the one that Attorney Willinger made before, it went on for a long time. He took a piece of Fort Trumbull, he took a piece of Gulf Beach, he took a piece of Supreme Court in the state of Connecticut, but in each instance, he leaves out details. And so he kind of patches together this Frankenstein monster of logic that would lead you to the, in my view, monstrous conclusion that this public right of way which has existed 
not for 15 years, which is the threshold with respect to adverse possession, which is something they're concerned about, but for over 115 years. And we're being asked to turn all that upside down. It's not that difficult, and it doesn't take that much time to tell the plain truth about matters. You'll see in this map that I've shown to you that some of the situations and some of the parcels that Attorney Willinger alluded to in his original presentation, Fort Trumbull, Gulf Beach, are actual parcels. If you look at the map, you'll see the road along the waterway, you'll see parcels that are on the landward side of the road, you'll see parcels that are on the water side of the road. This is from the city of Milford's GIS assessor's maps. These parcels all have numbers which are tax numbers. You see that at Fort Trumbull, you see that at Gulf Beach, you don't see it across from 108 Beach Ave. That's not parcel two. It's called Merwin Point. And it's a place that people have walked, fished, sunbathed, and done all sorts of things that folks do at the beach. The issue of what folks do at the beach is a legitimate public policy issue and a policing issue. There are all kinds of stuff that happens across from my house, closer to Anchor Beach. Fireworks, people drinking, people cussing, people playing horseshoes right on the grass, blocking the people who want to walk. It doesn't mean I can assert a right to own that property and to put up a fence and tell everybody to keep out. People are going to come to the beach. That some of them are poor, that some of them are Latino immigrants, that they have to be acculturated, that they're behaving in ways they shouldn't behave, we shouldn't tolerate it. But it's beside the point. You ought to be able to come here and say, this is the property. And it ought not to be put upon the staff or the commission, perhaps to the city attorney, but more fairly to the court. So that's on the property, my stance on the property. I want to show you one other map here, and this is from Woodmont, the borough of Woodmont, 1930. I, I couldn't make copies of this, but it will show you where the parcels are. Uh, the, one of the, the court cases that Attorney Willinger alludes to relates to Beach Avenue parcels that historically, even here in 1930, went right to the water's edge. They have that right to that property, and folks can't trespass across. He's correct about that. This parcel, 108 Beach Ave, is distinct. doesn't have that same history. I'll show you. Hey, you, can, you can talk into this microphone while you're here. I'd like to look at it. Oh, okay. That's 108 Beach Ave. So you see 108 Beach Ave, the defined lot, and then you see just the beach area. Now then, there's that little jog. This is 2 Chapel Street, which is the property that Mr. Willinger alluded to. Right. Parcel goes That's to the correct. water. Others do as well. Historically, there were pieces on the West Haven edge of Beach Ave where parcels existed as well, and those have been deeded in large part to the borough. So my main point is this is an assertion of a parcel that no evidence supports. Now, if, if you would just explain that to us three because yeah, it's harder to see there you go okay. this is beach ave mm -hmm. mr. mr chairman could, mr chairman mr chairman could you speak into a microphone yes yeah so what i'm showing is showing them the, the map from uh, a publication called woodmont on the sound and this is a map from 1930 and it shows Parcels that exist on the landward side of Beach Avenue, including 108 Beach. It shows no parcel demarcated on what we've been discussing, the Merwin's point. And it shows, alternatively, that in fact there are actual parcels that go to the water's edge. And those parcels, represented by 2 Chapel Street, were really covered by a Supreme Court decision that Attorney Willinger has alluded to that says folks do not have a right to pass there, that the folks who own to the sound do own to the high water line. But this is a public has been historically a public beach. You see another parcel here that's on the water's edge. That parcel exists, but it was deeded over to the borough. All I'm saying is you have to have an object, tangibly, irrefutably, to be talking about. And they haven't met that burden of proof, and it shouldn't be on us.
Okay, thank you for your patience with that. Um, so back to Merwin Point. One of the questions you asked was about taxes and whether there had ever been any property taxes paid on this parcel. Well, the only way a parcel exists to be taxed is if it has one of these parcel identification numbers that do exist for Trumbull Gulf Beach but do not exist here. So the answer is no. There's never been any tax bill issued for this property. Attorney Willinger said, don't worry about that. It's, it's picked up by the other property. It's just imputed into their value. That's not true, okay? This survey that they've shown you, and I'm using that term loosely, I want to get back to it, represents that there's a 22,000 square foot parcel. Now he doesn't want to call it a parcel, but for taxation, 22,000 square foot parcel is a very big parcel in the town of Milford. The land value of the parcel that does exist, does have a tax ID number at 108 Beach Street, Beach Ave, is uh, assessed against 0.2 acres, which is the size of that lot. The assessed value, bear with me one second, is $627,000. That's from today's look at the City of Milford's assessor records. Its appraised value, which they list there as well, is $895,000. It's just the land, 0.2 acres. So if you extrapolate, if 0.2 acres is pay, work, they ends up paying the tax bill on the land is $17,556. It's a big tax bill, just on land, against 0.2 acres. You can do the math, against 0.5 acres, 22,000 square feet, the tax bill at the current mill rate would be $44,000. I can tell you, as somebody who works for municipal government, that the tax assessor is not just going to dismiss a half-acre parcel on the waterfront in Long Island Sound and say, oh, well, it's kind of in the 0.2 acres over there. It's not. It's $44,000. They've never paid that tax. So I think, minimally, if, you, if you're going to go with this fence, that fence ought to cost some back taxes. You know, maybe I'd settle for 10 years, $440,000 to put up that little fence if it was that important. They're not so much asking you to deal with a zoning issue. They're asking you to legitimize a real estate transaction where they get a half acre of land on Lying Island Sound for free. And that's not right. Another issue, there's a lot of, quite frankly, it's, there's a lot of dubiousness. I'm going to use nice words, duplicitousness. I think there's actual deceit in some of this stuff. This, the petitioner is a group called, I think, Lehman Consulting Group. So now, they're saying Lehman Consulting Group owns this asserted parcel, and they don't even get a tax bill, but if they did get one, they actually pass it to another group. That's Masseri, who owns 108 Beach Street. Not a bad deal. If you, get, if you were to get a tax bill, you could just pass it to somebody else, a different owner altogether. So you have an asserted parcel, and in addition, this group, Lehman, registered with the New York State Secretary of the State's office, Leiden Consulting, L-E-D-E-N, okay? Bronx, New York, Domestic Business Corporation, inactive, this is from today, from the Secretary of State, inactive, dissolved by proclamation, annulment of authority, March 25th, 1992. Leo Masseri, 2705 Mickle Avenue, Bronx, New York, is listed as a registered agent of a corporation that's been dissolved for over 13 years. I'm going to put this on the record. Mr. Mr. Chairman, for the record, I, none of these issues he's, address he's talk, the zoning He's talking issue. right now. You're just yeah, going to have to wait. You, we here you know you have to wait issues? to rebut anything he's saying. The, Chuck, you don't have the floor. He, he has respect. the floor right now, Mr. Willinger. Go ahead, sir. I think standing is, is directly relevant. If you're a petitioner under a corporation that doesn't even exist, how do you have standing to petition? Of course it's relevant. And it shows a pattern of disingenuous representation before this commission. And nobody is obligated, Mr. Harris, none of the staff is obligated to act on things that are fraudulently represented. So with respect to this variance, the basis for their claim for a variance is a series, again, of assertions of trespassing, police actions. I went to the borough meeting 
Um, I reviewed the borough minutes for the past two years. Every month at the borough meeting, and I'm going to take issues up with the borough directly, they issue a constable report. There's no report relevant to this property in over two years' search of the minutes. So if it's all that bad, I'm kind of curious as to why there was never a constable report or anybody keeping track of that. Um, so again, there's an assertion. The other assertion Attorney Willinger made is that they have a worry about the health department cracking down on them because people litter. There's no record of any citation of any sort by the health department with respect to this property. You can't just come up here, assert some sort of peril, and then ask to be relieved from it. You have to be able to document it, and they haven't. As to this contention that they want to protect the public, that's ridiculous. There isn't anybody, even in the folks who've supported the petition, who really believes that this fence will keep people out of there. If anything, it's going to do nothing but create a trip hazard, especially now even at its lower height. It's a public right-of-way. Public rights-of-way are not just the asphalt. In fact, for most of the time this right-of-way has been in place, it wasn't even asphalted. It was just a dirt road. Public rights-of-way include sidewalks. They include street trees. They include greenery, Com Ave, other beautiful public rights-of-way. This was meant to be a beautiful public right-of-way. It juts out at every point, so you'll experience the beauty of that. At various points, particular plantings were made. In Woodmont, there's something they planted called the Cedar of Lebanon. It wasn't planted by the Messeries. It's been planted by the borough. It's not the unorganized public that's been using this land. It's the organized public that's invested and improved it over the years. So, you know, I, I would ask you not to legitimize this any further. Private property is private property, you know, and it may sound far-fetched, but I'm scratching my head as to why they want to do this. I know the core of it is their desire to escape from a, a liability premium they're being asked to pay. I imagine there's an insurance agent out there in New York State who's saying, gee whiz, you got this quick claim out there and I think you're exposed. You're going to have to pay a premium for that. And they don't want to pay it, which I understand. But this is the wrong remedy for that problem. There are other ways to do it. They could quick claim back to the borough. They say they don't want to do it. Well, then they have to really nail down their claim to ownership, and I don't think they've done that. All right, so in short, I think what you're being asked to deal with is a petition by a non-existent owner with respect to a non-existent parcel to put up a fence which in direct contravention to the objectives of uh, the city's master plan where you have Mayor Blake and others encouraging access to the waterfront, even installing bike racks down to the borough. Um, you know, Attorney Willinger quoted that the, the, the variance can't lead to the creation of a nuisance, fraud, victimization of the public. That little two-foot fence is going to be a nuisance. It's going to be an affront. It's going to be a bit of a hazard, a real one. And uh, I do think there's an aspect of fraud in what you're being asked to consider here. With respect to the borough and the purported overwhelming support, well, you're getting a look inside the, the tribe of Woodmont. And yes, there are people within the borough who want to privatize the beaches. And the folks who live immediately adjacent to this property have that interest. I don't blame them their perspective. But it isn't just Latino fishermen who come from New Haven who get out to Merwin Point and fish. It's also the guys who buy their bait and tackle at Bobby J's on Merwin on New Haven Ave. It's also me and my two kids where I taught them how to fish. It's also Linda Casey and David Casey, my next door neighbors at 18 Blackall Road. These are not irresponsible diaper wielding nudists and litterers. These are people who live in the borough. There are over 2,000 people in the borough. Eight folks in a, in a petition, 10 of the names on the petition are the Masseri family. God bless them for supporting each other. That's not overwhelming support. And then the borough itself. There's duplicitous, there's deceit happening there. You have on the record, Attorney Willinger has represented it twice now on the record, a letter from the borough warden, Ed Benessi. And he wrote the letter on borough stationery. He identifies himself in the narrative as the borough warden. He signed it as the borough warden. Attorney Willinger has put it in the record twice now and said, the borough supports this. I went to the borough meeting in January. I called him on it, and he said no, and it's on the record in the minutes of the borough. He said, no, that was a private letter. I'm just expressing my private point of view. Well, you don't do that on borough stationery. That, too, is an abuse. So there's a lot wrong here, and when there's that kind of doubt, that kind of deceit and dubiousness, why should we do anything? Don't tell us you, you mowed the lawn and picked up the picked up the trash, established a parcel legally, pay some taxes, and come here straight up. Thank you. Any questions for this gentleman? None? Okay. 
Okay, Mr. Willinger. First of all, is there anyone else speaking in opposition to this? Come up, come forward, please. Uh, good evening, uh, Chuck Rockwell, 28 Mark Street, Milford, Connecticut. I'm in opposition to the application. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Anyone else in opposition to this? Hi, Dan German, 114 Beach Ave. Um, I'm pretty close to that property. Um, and without reiterating everything that Bill has said, um, it's just a, it's a, a good public piece of property. A lot of people meet there, um, walkers meet there, runners meet there, bicycles meet there, bike, bicyclists meet there. Um, people meet there to watch the fireworks, West Haven. Um, it's just a beautiful piece of property. It's been, you know, um, have access to it for hundreds of years. And to close that off and, and, and deny people access to that, I think that's wrong. Um, a lot of people have expressed that to me. That's the only reason why I'm up here is, is kind of share those feelings with a lot of people that brought it to my attention. Um, so without reiterating everything he said, I don't know the, the whole legal issue of it, but um, as far as a public piece of property, it's, it's certainly enjoyed by thousands of people every year, and I'd be hate to see that um, be denied by all those people. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else speaking in opposition to the variance? Okay. Mr. Willinger? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> I would point out that none of, the, none of the three speakers in opposition have raised any zoning issues other than um, Mr. Coleman's reference to the fact that we are committing a fraud. And there's some language in your regulations for your flood that what we want to construct on the site would in essence be um, a detriment, and uh, he's alluded to it as uh, uh, our uh, perpetrating a fraud. And I've got to tell you, that's, um, that's an awful acquisition, uh, acquisition, uh, accusation to make. Uh, he started off, Mr. Coleman did, by saying he's not an expert. And he's not an expert uh, in terms of title and title ownership. The experts are the surveyor, and you have a survey. The experts uh, happen to be me. I'm a, a land use attorney. I'm a real estate attorney. I've examined title, and I've opined. I wouldn't sign an application where I didn't think we owned the property. Uh, and uh, more than that, at your request, we introduced an exhibit at our last hearing, if you recall, from a title company. And if you recall, that title company not only submitted their opinion letter dated December 4, 15, uh, but they also reviewed with this board uh, in that uh, document, uh, which I have now uh, in, in evidence in this hearing, uh, 100 years worth of deeds, 100 years. And they weren't quick claim deeds. They were the last four deeds happened to be warranty deeds. That's an exhibit in this action from a title company, a, a licensed, well-respected title insurance company. So the real experts uh, have gone on record. You've seen deeds not only to my parcel, but to our, some of our neighbors' parcels, and I'm gonna speak to that in reference to the taxes in a minute, because I do want this record to be absolutely crystal clear about ownership and taxes. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Mr. Coleman said, well, it's unfair. It's unfair that we have to put you in the middle of ownership. We didn't put you in the middle of an ownership issue. Ownership is not questioned. No one's questioning ownership. And frankly, uh, you have to assume, and your own, your own uh, zoning enforcement officers reviewed the records, uh, and he feels comfortable as, as well, and, and, and he's, not, he's not an expert. But you had your, your expert in zoning, you had uh, our surveyor, our title company, and myself, uh, t speaking about this issue. Uh, and what's unfair is that it's actually being r uh, raised again by a layman who frankly doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, we have submitted documentation, crystal clear documentation on ownership. He submitted a book with some kind of a map on it. I mean, come on, you, what's fair? What's fair? Is it fair that he accuses us of fraud? 
That's not fair. Uh, in terms of the taxes, and again, it's really not an issue. It's not an issue at all uh, with the, your board, but he raised it, and I, want, and I want to cover it. And I do want to put in the record, and I, I apologize for having to uh, do this for you, but I do want to put in the record uh, two, two documents. Uh, they're quite extensive, if I may. I could best summarize it by this document. I'll, I'll take the podium again in a okay. minute. But, and I'll explain it in a, in a moment. I don't expect you to read it now. I'm just going to highlight it. You Now, there are, this booklet shows that there are, in this sec, just this section of Beach Avenue, there are 16 parcels, not just our parcel, 16 different parcels uh, where the uh, owners on one side of Beach Avenue also had their, what we call our parcel two, the equivalent of our parcel two on the beach side, the on the Long Island Sound, the water side, 16 parcels. Eight of those parcels have conveyed that land, that land which is comparable to ours, to the, to the borough of Woodmont for liability reasons. They didn't want the liability. Eight of them, eight of the 16. But that leaves eight properties that still own parcel twos as, as do we has been certified time and time again in this hearing. So there's eight of us. Now on this single sheet, just not the, not the thicker handout, but I've kind of summarized the eight parcels that conveyed the property to parcel two to the town and eight that c c still have them. And you have the addresses, 132 Beach Avenue, 130, 128, 124, 110, 108, 104, 100. Those are the eight parcels that still own property that Mr. Coleman, and I'm very surprised and disappointed in Mr. German, German, that they want to tell you that it's, that, that it's public property. Well, it's nonsense. It's not public property. And in terms of taxation, I don't know what the tax collector did or the tax assessor did in terms of a separate lot. I don't know if he co-joined or co-mingled parcels one and parcel two. Has no relevance at all with your decision. But what I do know is that my clients and these eight these eight owners uh, are paying in today's taxes taxes from twenty five thousand five hundred and seventy dollars uh, down to for the smaller parcels fifteen thousand dollars a year in taxes. I don't know how much taxes Mr. Coleman pays, but you can bet it's nowhere near that uh, this kind of tax. And on a per acreage basis, their assessment, take a look at this document, ladies and gentlemen, and you want to know if we're being taxed, if my people are being taxed. On a per acreage basis, the assessment, which is 70 percent of value, by the way, 70 percent of value, uh, we're being taxed Per, on a per acreage basis, $3,135,000 for an acre. Uh, and uh, that is, and up to 132 Beach Avenue, $5,400,000 uh, an acre. So believe me, even though it's not a zoning issue, uh, from a tax standpoint, the city of Milford certainly is being taxed, uh, are taxing these property owners. Uh, uh, more than their fair share. So the re we're being taxed. We're not complaining about the taxes. We're paying the taxes on land that we own. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's my point. It's land that we own, and we're paying uh, a, a high price for it. And all we want to do is protect that land. And there's, nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong uh, uh, with that request. So as far as the borough meetings that he attends or doesn't attend, Mr. Coleman, I can't speak to that. You saw the letter 
The letter is in evidence. You could read the letter and decide for yourself. All I can tell you is that other than the three people that spoke here in, in opposition, and one more that was quasi opposed the very first night. I don't know if that lady was really opposed or not. But other than that, we've got a petition signed by literally every neighbor uh, in, that, uh, in that section that's affected by this application. And there's no, there's no neighborhood opposition. And I wouldn't term, by the way, Mr. Coleman, a, an impacted neighbor. He has a house in, in the rear somewhere. Uh, in terms of his statement, it's, and, it, and it, it's, it boggles my mind where he could get up here and say to you, I don't know why they want to do this. You don't know why. Now, you see, he testified the first night that his son, he enjoyed watching his son on a bicycle on our rocks. I don't know if you recall that. That was his testimony. That's one of the, absolutely one of the reasons why we want to do this. Because his son or somebody on those rocks one day, if left alone, is going to break their neck. And, uh, and, and there's tremendous liability associated with that. And there's no way that that should be, that should be allowed. Uh, the, in terms of Mr. Uh, uh, German's uh, testimony that it, uh, he's in the neighborhood, he is in the neighborhood. There's no question he's in the neighborhood. And he's seen this booklet. That's why I'm, I'm a little disappointed with him. Of course, he doesn't own the property right across the street. Uh, there's no land right across the street. It's just the, the, the water. But I, I dare say if he was in our position and had, he was looking out of his porch in the summer, looking on his property and seeing the pictures that I displayed in this book, he'd sing a different tune before this commission. Uh, as far as the people enjoying themselves, sure they, they enjoy themselves. But how about the property owner? which is a, 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 one of the most basic, probably the basic constitutional right. Uh, a man's house is his castle, and I'm, and I'm asking you just to please put your, yourself in, in the position uh, of a property owner having to look at, uh, at what's happening on that parcel. Uh, but to speak to the issues, because you could do all these red herrings about ownership and taxation and all that, uh, is none of that uh, should and could enter into your decision. Your decision is, can we grant, legally grant a variance to this property owner? You can if there's a need for the variance. You can if there's a hardship, which there is, that location and all the other reasons that I mentioned for hardship, and whether it will create a flooding condition, which it certainly won't for these six tiny signs. So for all those reasons, I would ask you just to please, don't be misled by some of this opposition nonsense. They never spoke to any of the issues that are really germane to the, your decision in granting this, uh, 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 granting this variance. And I would ask you please to disregard all that nonsense. Think about what you're charged to do, which is to enforce your zoning regulations and grant variances for relief that a property owner needs and uh, to grant these variances. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Mr. Soda. Mr. Willinger, so you're saying that they, they pay 25,000 taxes on the main house at 108, and the parcel across the street is 15,000? That's what you just told us? <coughs> no, I am saying that What was they, the 15 you were talking about? I, I lost you there. You no, said no, 25 said the, and then 15. No, there's another neighbor that pays 15,000. Our, 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 our taxes okay. are $25,000 a year. We're paying $25,000 25000 All right. Okay. And, and by the way... Uh, and I asked you this before, was there... How much land is the tax assessor charging you on? What is your parcel on his record? I, I don't believe... I, I don't know how to answer that because I don't well, believe the tax... Uh, I don't believe the tax assessor has accurate records on it. I really don't. But could I ask you a question? Why, why is that concerning you. Well, what, some what people is your are saying this is public it? property and... It's not public property though. No. You, you, you can't say it's public property with all the evidence that's here. I, I don't understand. How could you challenge ownership? This is, you're, you're not here to decide who's the owner. You've got an evidence. You've got no credible evidence to say it's not. You've got a layman that's here that gives you a book and that's, that's ri ridiculous. The evidence that you have for ownership is our petition 
signed by a, a commissioner of superior court, a surveyor, and a title company. I don't know what else to give you in terms of ownership. That's not, that's not the issue. If he's got an issue with ownership, let him sue us in a civil court. That's not why you're here. You're not a tax collector. You're not a property owner. You're a board member that's got to take a look at a piece of property and grant the variance or don't grant the variance for zoning reasons. So uh, honestly, that is beside the point. What you've got, what, I, what you should be doing, in my humble opinion, is looking at our property, taking a look at what we suffered, taking a look at that book, and if you were sitting on your front porch looking at that, for, on property that you're paying $25,000 a year taxes, how would you feel? And it, is, who, who are we hurting by having these one foot square signs that say no trespassing? Who are we hurting? It's not a title issue, that's not your issue. And I'm telling you, as a commissioner of the Superior Court, we own that property. There was a Superior Court case, he talks about public easement or public access, that's nonsense. There's a Superior Court case that I told you about the last, uh, the last time that's on this same, very same beach. And people made the same argument that, oh, we walk through and we use it and therefore we have a public easement. And the answer was no, you don't. There was a Supreme Court right on the same beach. So we've got all the evidence, all the testimony, all, I don't know what else I can do to prove ownership, which is really not your issue. Is there any other questions? Is there any other questions for Mr. Willinger? I think we do want an answer as to whether the taxes are commingled. You're saying it doesn't matter, but it does matter, I think. It matters to me. It matters why to do, me. Could you, could, uh, can I ask you, you why it matters to you? Because, it, because if you own a piece of property, it's your property because you've been paying taxes on it. You say you don't, you don't know. I, I mean, don't know. So, I so don't this know is what, really, no, we are at a point right now where, the, before I make a decision on this myself, I want this tax assessor, we want some, something from the tax assessor that states that they've actually paid taxes on that property. Okay. Okay. Before us, before the, the first one was, do you own the property? So we've already gone through all of that. That's been belabored for months and months now. So, you okay. know, the, the appeal had gone in your favor for the fence. Okay. But we're looking at the variance on this right now. And I do question the taxes. Okay, but and I have every Mr. right to. Mr. Chairman. And rather okay. than you saying that we I, don't have that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. I'm I'm sure. glad. Yes, Mr. Harris. I would like to remind the board that tax matters, tax issues are not, are not a zoning matter. So if there's a dispute about taxes, how much should be paid, how much was paid, that's a matter between the assessor and the owner, not the, the Zoning Board of Appeals. Okay, thank you. Any more well, questions? Mr. Harris, Mr. Harris, what if this isn't a parcel and it is public property. That's what my concern is and we're putting, allowing them to put signs on public property. You were down the tax office, what did the tax assessor say? Is this a city owned parcel or is this a private parcel? I went to the, the tax assessor's office when I was trying to determine if this was a lot. And subsequent, uh, last meeting, Mr. Willinger submitted um, a long string of deeds which I, I examined. Uh, in the intervening months, and I'm not a title searcher, I'm not going to pretend to be one, but in my opinion, I think we have a lot of record that was created before 1929. So I'm, I'm happy that there's a parcel out there, you know, speaking as a, as a zoning enforcement officer. But um, in my opinion, all this, all this talk about taxes is, 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 is off point. Can I just okay. ask a clarification? Go ahead, Mr. Abbott. So taxes, whether the accuracy of taxes doesn't call in question ownership of, of a property. I mean, if it's already been determined by land records that, in fact, it has been conveyed as one parcel. Right? The, 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 tax, the, the taxes on yeah. the parcel are between the owner and the assessor. Not, the, it's not a matter for the, for the ZBA. Any more questions for Mr. Willinger? Okay. This hearing is closed. Thank you. Okay, discussion. I think the only question at hand here is whether or not uh, uh, we get, whether or not 
you know, they're entitled to the variance for the signs. Uh, ownership, I think, has been established, at least to the satisfaction of, of our zoning enforcement officer. Uh, we may want to, you know, let the tax uh, department know that maybe they need to look into the property. <laughs> they maybe do some uh, more money, uh, but, you know, I, I think, I don't think that is going to affect whether or not uh, ownership is there. I think it's already been established, at least, for our bird's purposes, based on our, our people we, person we consult with, the zoning enforcement officer. So, back to whether or not there's a hardship that warrants them having six small signs, or does the, they're already entitled to one sign, is, is that what they're entitled to, and so be it. That's pretty much, go ahead, Mr. Soda. Mr. Harris, so if we deny the variance, they're allowed one sign, no more than nine square feet, correct? The regulations for this, for a residential zone permit, uh, one sign. Okay, any, any other discussion? Do we have a motion? You want to, do you have more discussion? Go ahead. Well, I, I mean, I feel if one sign is sufficient for the piece of property. They're putting a fence up. That's okay. my opinion. Any other thoughts? Uh, Mr. Vecina, go ahead. Um, well, it, it's uh, open forum within the board. Do you think that one sign, if they only have one sign, then they can potentially grow it to the dimensions that they have here, you, you, would you rather see that sign size than the six small ones? I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I guess I've been, I've been quiet so far, so let me weigh in on a couple things. I think ownership, number one, has been established. I think there's a lot of compelling testimony that's gone back and forth, but I definitely think that ownership has been established by experts that um, I believe we have to trust. Um, the tax issue, we know, I mean, I have people walk up to me all the time that say, I saw you on TV, so I'm sure the tax assessor is watching this thing and they'll deal with that, with whatever they need to deal with. I think we know that. So that's, that's great. Um, I don't have a problem with the six signs being the size, to be honest with you. That's, that's just me. And that's what makes a fun board. I guess, you know, unless you talk, uh, having one large sign versus having a few small signs, I can see the smallness maybe being a little bit more attractive <laughs> for the property. Uh, my concern is about the number of them, uh, maybe. Uh, and, you know, I, I need, they need to do the sides of the property, and they got the fence. They really need to put six all over. Uh, so I, I, I guess. Uh, I guess the number, I guess, is what I'm questioning about. You ready for a motion? Um, well, I'm not ready for a motion yet, if you don't mind. Um, I don't think that we can propose a new number of signs, right? It's either accept what they have or, Mr. Harris, right, it's accept what they have or deny. I personally think, feel one, one sign would be acceptable. That's my opinion. What's I don't believe you can change the nature of their application. Right, right. That's what I would think. Okay. We're ready when you are. Well, I'll make a motion to deny.
need a second? We have a motion to deny. I'll second the motion. Reasons, reasons. Mr. Soda? I don't Mr. think they proved the hardship. We have a motion to deny. We have a second on the motion. Mr. Soda? With the motion. Mr. Vecino? I'm against the motion. Mr. Haberman? With the motion. Ms. Franti? Against the motion. I'm with the motion. Fails. Item, okay, go ahead. Item number three, 751 East Broadway, zone R5, Thomas Lynch, Esquire attorney for Nicholas Macero, owner, section 3-1-4-1, section very west side yard, set back to 5.2 feet, need, where 10 feet a, required, 4.1.4 uh, uh, east side yard projection to 1.8 feet, where 8 feet permitted, and 1.6 where 8 feet permitted for land, uh, landing and stairs and deck. 4.1.4 west side yard projection to 5.3 feet where 8 feet permitted for front and rear deck to relocate and, and elevate existing home, map 22, block 474, parcel 23. Mr. Lynch, I know you've been patiently waiting. Uh, we have to just take a, a technical break for a few minutes. Oh, sure. Okay? Yep. We'll be right with you. Okay, uh, we're ready to resume. Okay. Okay, Mr. Lynch, thank you for your patience. You're all set? No. That's a tough. That's a that's a tough one to follow. All right, Meg, you all set? All right. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the record, my name is Thomas Lynch. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Lynch, Trimbicki, and Boynton, and my office is located here at 63 Cherry Street. And I have the pleasure of being here tonight with my uh, uh, clients, uh, Leo and Stephanie uh, Kutayas, who are the uh, contract Kutikas, who are the contract purchasers of the property located at 751 East Broadway uh, along the uh, shoreline on the western end of town. And uh, the proposal tonight is uh, to bring forward to you a plan to allow for <clears throat> the raising, and when I say raising, I don't mean R-A-Z-I-N-G, I mean raising, R-A-I-S-I-N-G, uh, the house to meet the current uh, flood level standards in that area. Uh, elevation 13 will be the uh, ground floor area elevation uh, for construction. And the application before you is to uh, allow variances to basically maintain the side yard setbacks exactly as they are now with the existing structure. The first sheet <clears throat> of the plans that we submitted to you show uh, the existing frame residence. As Stephen is aware, there's so many houses along East Broadway there that are actually constructed where the front, uh, uh, front sidewalks or the front stoops of the houses are actually within the street right of way. Uh, this, this house, as it currently exists, is somewhat off of the uh, 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 city right of way along East Broadway, but it's non-conforming both <clears throat> in terms of the uh, side yards and the front yard. Uh, it's a non-conforming lot as well. It consists of some 3,700 square feet in the R5 zone. So what we want to do is to take the house. Uh, second sheet shows the proposed plan is to move it back some 20 feet uh, with a small deck in the front, which will be accessed by uh, 
uh, stairways coming along the eastern side of the property uh, next to the uh, proposed driveway. Moving the house back, again keeping all of the rear yard setbacks, but maintaining the basic 5.2 inch setback on either side for the principal residence and to have a uh, deck in the rear. Now, <clears throat> that deck will also conform with the rear yard setbacks. The stairs, as we've submitted to you, um, uh, are along the side of the house so that they don't encroach on the uh, jurisdictional uh, uh, boundary line of the, for the coastal area management uh, guidelines. But uh, basically, there's going to be really no other work done to the house. They're going to raise it up, move it back, put a rear deck on. Uh, it's in conformity with the other uh, residences in the area. I know that uh, Mike Mecca, who's uh, uh, the adjoining property owner <clears throat> on the western side, is here and uh, will have some comments to you at the conclusion of my presentation. But, you know, basically it's a reasonable request. The hardship clearly is in the fact that it's a narrow lot. In all respects, the lot is non-conforming. So this is to move the house back, add the deck to the rear, and to uh, uh, not uh, increase the side yard setbacks at all, and actually reduce the non-conformity of the, uh, uh, the present front yard uh, situation. Again, for brevity, I, you know, I, I know you have a number of other applications tonight. We do have floor plans that have been prepared and attached, but there's going to be no basic change on the inside of the house, some remodeling, but uh, uh, the basic thrust is to take the existing residence, move it back, uh, increase the front yard setback, and uh, <clears throat> maintain the side yard uh, uh, setbacks as they are. The house is uh, clearly reasonable in size. It's three bedrooms. It's roughly 1,285 square feet. That was built in uh, uh, 1915. Uh, the Maceros have owned the property for a number of years. Now they're moving on, and Leo and Stephanie want to, as you can see, she's here tonight with her infant child. They want to. Uh, uh, established their uh, presence in the neighborhood. If you recall, we were before you last month, uh, last year with a, another variance request that they were seeking for their restaurant down the street. They are the owners of the Greek Spot restaurant, so uh, they really are making a commitment to the uh, uh, Broadway area and uh, not only maintaining a business there, but they now want to live here. So we'd ask that you ask favorably on uh, the application so they can move forward with these plans. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lynch. Any questions for Mr. Lynch? Uh, Mr. Lynch, will there be parking under the house? There's one car garage underneath. Okay. Yeah. Plus the driveway that can accommodate the other off-streets. There's no off-street parking, as you know, driving through that area, so this really does uh, uh, help in that respect. Anyone else speaking in favor of this application? Hi, I'm uh, Michael Mecca, 749 East Broadway. Uh, I'm in favor of uh, the proposed uh, raising of the house and the under the street, under the house, excuse me, under the house parking. <clears throat> I just think it's good plan management to get uh, any house away from uh, harm's way. We know the tides are rising and it's just a matter of when we get another storm. Uh, my house and that this house in question were both se severely damaged in Hurricane Sandy, so um, I think it's almost a necessity for a young family to have to raise the house to make sure that they're protected. Thank you, sir. Hold on, I have a question. <clears throat> for the man they just yeah. talked, Mr. Mecca, can you come back? Can you please? come back for a sec? We we have a we have a question for you. I'm sorry to bother you. No, no worries. Just your address. You said seven. 749. 749. So yeah. you're on the side that the stairs are going to be on? No, I'm on the other side. Huh. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right. I just wanted to confirm. All right. Just that. make sure that the survey is. Flip flopped, right? Okay. But, I mean, that lays more credence that you're on the side where the stairs are. So that's great. Thank you. He's not. Okay. Can I, can I also just add one? One additional comment, the, the thought may have arisen with the stairs for the deck 
in the rear instead of them coming flush straight out without being on the side and uh, seeking the projection uh, variance. But that would then infringe within the coastal area management. The boundary of that is uh, shown as basically coming up right to the edge of the deck. So. So uh, just one quick question for the board. So the steps are on the east or the west side that you guys are voting on? I know, but there was some confusion. Okay. I think the confusion was they had your address wrong. Okay. The address is wrong on the survey. Drawing showing the west side. Correct? They originally were, but we submitted the revised plans. That's why we didn't go forward last month. The stairs are on the east side. If you, if okay. you recall, this was on your agenda for last month, and uh, we did uh, move the uh, stairs to the other side. Okay, any other questions for these gentlemen? Anyone else speaking in favor? Hello, uh, my name is Rob Versalone. I live at 715 East Broadway. Um, I'm also in favor of them getting approved. Um, you know, the house needs to be lifted to get out of the floodplain. They're a young family and they're trying to better their home. Thank you. Anyone else speaking in favor? Is there anyone here opposed to this application? Any questions? Board, any questions? No? Okay, this hearing's closed. So they're centering the house. Do you mind if I start? I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. So they're centering um, the house. They've moved it back. Um, they don't have any problem with the rear yard. Um, the nonconformity on one of the sides is actually less. And then the other side, the nonconformity is in lieu of the stairs because they're elevating the house. Mm -hmm. So I personally don't see a problem with the application. Thank you. Thank you. I feel the same way. Ms. Ferranti? Yeah, I don't have a problem with this. It's going to be the same house, just raised, and that necessitates the stairs. I have no problem with this. Okay. I think I'm going to make a motion to approve. Second. Reason for the approval is the hardship is the um, orientation, the narrowness of the lot, and um, I'd like to base the approval upon the survey that was presented for us today. We have a motion to approve. We have a second on the motion. Mr. Soda? With the motion. Mr. Vecino? I'm with the motion. Mr. Haberman. With the motion. Ms. Ferranti. With the motion. I'm with the motion. It's passed. Okay. Um, item number four, before Mr. Haberman reads it in, um, Ms. Ferranti is going to be recusing herself from this hearing. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Yes. You'll fill in for Ms. Ferranti, please. Certainly. Mr. Secretary. Item number four, 52 Pond Street, R12.5, Kevin Kersedin, Esquire Attorney for Laura Higgins, owner, section 3-1-4-1, front yard set back to 23.5 feet, where 30 feet required, southeast side yard set back to 7.2 feet, where 10 feet required, northwest side yard set back to 8.75 feet, where 10 feet required, 4.1.4, front to 22.5 where 24 feet permitted south east side overhang to 6.2 feet where 8 feet permitted northwest side overhang to 7.75 feet where 8 feet permitted for new garage map 44 block 404 parcel 18a good evening mr chairman members of the board uh, kevin crusade my office is at 26 cherry street I'm representing Lori Higgins, the owner of the property. She's here with me tonight. Um, also, uh, Jim Denno, the designer, is also here. I'd just like to submit the affidavit of the uh, sign posting and some photos.
A little bit of background about this site. It's an R12-5 zone. Uh, front yard setback required is 30 feet. Each side yard is 10 feet. The lot minimum width is 80 feet, uh, and the lot minimum depth is 100 feet. Uh, the original house predates zoning regulations. It was built in 1840. Uh, it's pre-existing, pre legal nonconforming. Um, there, have been, there was an addition since it was built, which is the garage. You'll see it in the photos, or if you've driven by the property, you'll see the garage there. That was, a, that was built in the late 70s. Um, this lot is 52.1 feet wide and approximately 160 feet long. The lot is 8,538 square feet, which is 3,962 square feet less than the required lot size for this zone. The current structure, um, the original structure, is on, on the northwesterly side is 8.8 uh, .8 feet from the property line, and that's where that house has sat since it was built in 1840. On the um, southeasterly side, going more towards the um, where Pond Street curves down around the harbor uh, is 7.2 feet. Um, and that's been in place since uh, that addition was built in uh, 1977 or so. Originally, there were two houses on this lot, or this lot was comprised of two houses. It was 52 Pond Street and what's now known as 48 Pond Street, I believe. The hot, we have several hardships. The lot's undersized for the zone by 3,962 feet. It's undersized compared to the other lots overall in the, in the R12-5 zone. The lot's non-conforming. The shape of the lot is long and narrow, and it has uh, some jogging lines, especially on the southeasterly side. It's located in a historic district, which in and of itself doesn't make it a hardship, but there's a hardship with respect to um, whatever additions you need to do will have to be approved and receive their certificate of appropriateness from the Historic District Commission. So that limits, uh, and Jim Denno can speak to this if you want to talk to him about it, but that limits um, what you can do uh, with the property. So for example, the, um, the, li the lines of the house will force you to design the addition in a certain way in order to meet the Historic District requirements. Um, as part of this process, Lori, uh, in um, conjunction with Jim and their contractor, had looked at other options. Uh, one of the other options possibly being just going out within the set, within and meeting the setbacks and just extending off the back of the house. Um, Lori flat out rejected that, op that uh, option because she thought that that would have a greater impact on the neighbor's views of the harbor than what's being proposed. Um, as you know, the standard for granting a variance is the strict letter of the zoning ordinance must be shown to cause unusual hardship unnecessary to the carrying out of the general purpose of the zoning plan. Um, these variances that we're requesting, although it seems like it, it is several variances and it's lengthy uh, word-wise, really when you look at the elevations and the plans, they're extending, like for example, the garage area. It's just bringing the front of the house out to where front of the, the remaining portion of the existing house is in the front porch, so it's just leveling that off. It's also doing that same on the uh, northwesterly side. It's bringing it back um, within the same 8.8 .8 foot existing setback. It's not asking for any more. There is some new construction on that back corner. It's going back um, a few feet and with a second floor addition. And the same, similarly on the right-hand side, it's staying within the existing lines of the house. So uh, um, Lori um, is going to be moving in with her mom. They need the additional space uh, for uh, living space, and they also need the additional garage space to bring the cars off the street. It's a small driveway, so they have better off-street parking, um, and it just allows them to have more space in the garage and, and the, um, the, park, the driveway. So uh, pending your questions, well, the, the only other things you're looking for a variance for here is, and this would be new, you mentioned you already have uh, some of these variances with the existing structure. The proposed balcony, there's one on the back, there's one on the side. That's new to the... That'll be new, but that, those are within, I think, um, those are within the, the, 
the required setbacks already, I believe. Okay, and you mentioned as far as when you first looked at the plans, as far as maybe going back, in which way? Would, would that have been just squaring off the structure, or what would have? Um, I can ask, I can have uh, Jim come out and speak about, come up and speak about that, but my understanding is is just um, straight back within the um, 10 foot on each side and just go directly back so you don't have to request any variances, which would, but it would be two stories. So it would just extend the, the house back and probably cause further obstruction of views than what's proposed. What is actually back there? Just the harbor? Well, uh, I'm saying just the harbor, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, right now there's a deck um, and then there's grass and a yard and there's a shed, like I think there's a shed in the back and then it's the harbor. There's views of the harbor. It's a, it's a, it's a great neighborhood. Um, people have, you know, uh, great opportunity to look at the harbor. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, yep. Any questions for Mr. Crusade? No? Okay, no? You're all satisfied? Okay. Anyone else speaking in favor of this application? Is anyone here opposed to this application? If you're opposed, come forward, please. State your name, your address. <clears throat> Bob McKendrick at 48 Pond Street, the house next door, and I've got some pictures that I could hand out. Bring them forward, sir. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to object to all the variations on the grounds that the house is <clears throat> already too big for the small lot it's on. It's obvious. Um, in particular, the variance on the northwest corner would allow the back addition to be built even closer than it is to the house already, which you can see from the picture. Um, this addition is also going to be a, put a second story on back there, which will. Uh, oh, present an overwhelming wall just outside the windows of our house on that side of the house blocking the views and all the light coming into the house and I believe that will reduce the value of our of our house and make it a less desirable place to live and that's it okay you're the greenhouse to our right on this picture right. Any questions for this gentleman? Go ahead. <clears throat> Sir, I just have a question for you. You do know that if they're trying to keep the addition closer to the road, then that if they make it narrower and go back, they could go back a lot more, which would greatly exactly. impair your yeah. view. Yeah, so I they're trying think, to keep they're yeah. trying to keep it close. But I see no reason why they couldn't go toward the harbor. There's a lot of room on that side. So still they could make it bigger, but rather than going back and ruining everybody's view. They could go toward the harbor and not bother anyone. Did, did you so, follow that, Mr. Soda? Yeah. Uh, go? go ahead, Mr. Vecina. Sir, when I, when I look at the plan, it looks like it's on your side of the house, unless I'm disoriented, and I'm sorry if I am. But it looks like they're just going... He's this side, right? Yeah. Looks like they're just going from the street. You're on the left, right? Looking at it from the street. Yeah, you're from on the, the left. Street. Yeah, we're the, Perfect. the greenhouse. They're the blue house. Perfect. Mm -hmm. It looks like they're just going back, though, in line with the current level of the house. Right. So how are they encringing closer on you? Because the current, the current uh, addition that's back there is set back quite a way, about three or four You're feet from, more property being on from that line, this extended that line. Right here. Okay, all right, Okay. thank so, you. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I just want to understand your concern. Okay. Thank you. Right. Any other questions for this gentleman? No? Anyone else speaking in opposition? Kathy Gage, 47 Pond Street. I live across the street from this property. 
I have a lot of concerns about the requested variances for shorter setbacks at, Fort, at 52 Pond Street. Um, first of all, the zoning laws are in place for a very good reason to protect the homeowners on the street. Second, this house in particular is unusual in that it's already very close to the house next door, number 48 Pond Street. The two homes, as were said, were built at the, uh, on the same property and then the property was split. They were mirror image homes and much smaller over the years they've been added, the, the 52 has been added to. I res respectfully request denying the variances to make them even closer together. No other home on the street has homes as close together as these and this would make it worse. This is a huge number of renovations requiring quite a few variances to those planning and zoning regulations in place to protect us. The front yard setback is of a concern in particular. Uh, it would not impact Waterview now, but could lead to future variances that might, and I hope the 30 feet would remain unchanged. But I also wonder why such a large change needed to be made anyway. The notice sent to us was received Wednesday, technically within the state guidelines according to the planning and zoning personnel. It was not, however, enough time for neighbors to learn what was being requested. It left us only Thursday, Friday, Monday, and today to look over the plans. And if you work, good luck. If you do not get a chance, <coughs> if you do get a chance um, to go, you, don't, you have to have a lot of time to digest the unbelievable number of changes and additions. Even the workers at Parsons had difficult explaining some of these variances. The letter was also mailed by a lawyer. That's the first time in 38 years I've lived here that the owner was not the one to mail the letter. It usually comes with a nice uh, return address from the owners of the home with a personal note. I request you look very carefully at the, re at the requests with the property to see the impact that the variances would have. <clears throat> and please stay true to the regulations by not approving the variances which will make the properties even closer and impact um, privacy for some neighbors while the aesthetics being even closer with these homes. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in opposition? Anyone else in opposition? Mr. Kasaden, you can rebut. Yeah, I um, want to make it clear. I don't know if it's clear from the reduced size versions that you have that the variance um, on the gentleman's side that spoke against uh, who uh, owns 48 Pond Street um, most of that is a, s a second floor addition that's already within the existing footprints of the house. It's just the back corner of that um, where we're asking, we're going to eventually, they would like to be able to put in a, uh, um, have some additional living space. The, as far as the house becoming closer to the other houses on the, uh, on the street or the neighbors, this is really just round, this is really just bringing the existing lines that um, are not even, they're making them even as far as the, the front setback goes. So the 23 feet that we're asking for, there's a, the half of the house is already 23 feet from the street. So they're just bringing the garage up, making it evening the front of the house off. It's the same thing on the left hand side where it does go back. Uh, a certain number of feet, um, but it's within the 8.8 .8 feet setback that's already there. And the same on the, on the uh, right-hand side, as you're looking at it from the street, it's 7.2 feet. With respect to the, the mailings, we've, we follow the mailings um, as required. Um, I always send the letter from my office, so it's nothing that was personal or wasn't done um, to be impersonal, but I always do it to make sure it's done correctly. Um, so I think uh, there's definitely a hardship with respect to the size of the lot and the existing configuration with the house on the lot. Um, from what I'm hearing, I think some of the concerns are more or include the second story, which I think 80 or 90 percent of that um, we could build as of as of right uh, without asking for a variance. Uh, we, we talked about the historic district. Yeah. Um, how much impact will they have on this project? Well, we actually have a hearing tomorrow night um, to discuss with them and see if they'll grant a certificate of appropriateness. Um, Jim Denno can speak to the changing the plans. If we were just going to go straight back, for example, I think that, that we were having an earlier conversation tonight, and I think that that has an impact on the architectural lines that um, 
might cause the historic district commission to find that that it's not appropriate. So we're competing with two different boards, um, not competing, but we have two different boards to satisfy and some of those different requirements are at, are at odds. Um, I don't think that um, the requested uh, addition or variances are, are, are obnoxious for the neighborhood or excessive. Um, it's just kind of squaring off the existing house and adding some additional living space. Uh, it's a long lot. They, they, they could go back, I think the, the rear setback is 25 feet. I mean, they have a lot of space to go back within the existing setback, but I, I don't think that that is going to look uh, nice uh, compared to what they have now, and I don't know that that will satisfy the Historic District Commission. So even without, if we, if we were to deny the variances, there's still going to be construction going on in that house, you know, uh, depending on what the Historic District says. So there's going to be... It would probably cause some. It would probably cause some re, some minimal redesign, uh, or some, not minimal, but it would probably cause uh, a redesign uh, of of the architecture and the um, uh, interior. And uh, it would it would, have, it would definitely have an impact. But they'll still eventually. I, I'm assuming they're going to need the space, so there'll be some construction. Yeah. Any questions for Mr. Crusade, gentlemen? No, no questions. Okay, this hearing's closed. Thank you. Okay. Three. So what do we think? Two? Okay. Okay. Any, what are your comments? What are your thoughts? They're not encroaching any further into the, the, the setback. Uh, they are squared off that bo uh, back corner, squaring off the front where the porch is. Um, uh, they can go up two stories. It's already two stories, I believe. They, they can some parts of it. Um, I, so I. I really don't see a, a problem with it. Uh, uh, again, they're not going farther into that setback. They're not getting closer to that uh, to the adjacent houses, um, with the exception of squaring off that one side, which I think is about 13 feet uh, in the corner there. So um, uh, it's basically the same footprint, and, and they're just going up a little bit more and. Uh, try and keep it from extending too far back to block everybody's view. So I, I my comment. Okay, any other comments? Mr. Soda? Well, I mean, they are keeping it in line with the house and they could go back a lot further, which would really, you know, so I kind of agree with everything previously said. So, um, you know, I, I, I feel what the neighbors are saying, but I think they could go up three stories high and even be worse, you know. Okay, we need a motion. Make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion. Go ahead. He's for approval, and the, the hardship is the, uh, uh, the size and shape of the, the lot, and for the other reasons noted in the survey uh, provided in the package. We have a motion to approve. We have a second on the motion. Mr. Thomas. With the motion. Mr. Haberman. With the motion. Mr. Vecino. With the motion. Mr. Soda. With the motion. I'm with the motion. It's approved. Okay, item number five. Uh, I'm going to recuse myself from item number five. So Mr. Haberman. And Mr. Thomas is the voting. Item five. Uh, well, Sarah's, Sarah's coming back. Sarah, for right. you, okay. Mr. Dubois, Mr. Thomas. Okay, so Mr. Dubois, you'll fill in for me. Let's see. Is that right? One, two. Yes. Mr. Dubois, okay. so you'll take my place. Are you going to chair the meeting? Yes, I'll he is. Chair it. Who would yeah. like to, you want to read? Or let Sarah sure. read it. Oh, Sarah, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. John will read it. Okay. You okay? Yes. Okay.
Item number five, 240 Naugatuck Avenue in a CDD-2 zone. MKC Club Incorporated Owner, Section 5.5.1.2, Distance Regulation to 201 where 300 required for Private Club, Map 15, Block 54, Parcel 9F. You can uh, go ahead and uh, just give your name and address for the record. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Sell. I live at 36 Judson Place. I'm the uh, chairman of the Relocation Committee and a member of the Board of Directors of the MKC Club. My name is Richard Murley, 120 Sherryland Drive. I'm a member of the Board of Directors and a representative of the Council. Go ahead and present. What we're looking to do is um, we are looking to move our liquor license from our previous residence or our, uh, building where we were and move it to a place where our liquor license currently exists. Um, we know that the regulation requires that we need to be within 300 feet, so we're looking for the variance on that regulation um, because we're in 300 feet of a, a learning center. But as we said, there's a, a current liquor license there now. Um, we are a private club, not a not open to the public, so the traffic would be considerably less. Um, our hours of operation would not interfere with the school hours as well. The reason we chose this location, coming, I, most of you know the Knights of Columbus, Milford Knights, we sold our building. It was too big to, and too expensive to operate. Um, so we've downsized to an affordable building, an affordable size that we can um, maintain. And um, the existence of um, the restaurant that's in place at the moment has been there for over 50 years. So our club would be a private club. It's, there's meetings, our, our club meetings, and then there's a social aspect to it. Um, we've been in this town for uh, 125 years, over 125 years. And we, we're trying to maintain that for the community. We do a lot of community activities and support, you know, the local Milford and the entire community. So we're trying to stay localized near um, our area, which is the Devon area and the churches down in that area. So that would be the reason we're trying to relocate so close to our um, original location and stay in that end of Milford. Uh you had quite a bit of parking on the other place. Uh, is that an issue for you, parking here, or? No, it's not. We actually rented to Chevy the whole time because he was paying some of our bills. <laughs> um, we didn't use all the parking over there. So you're going to be a club now, so you, because if for your liquor license, you, you're too close to the school by about, about what, about 50 yards, 50, uh, what is it? 99. 99, 99 feet, feet. Okay. to their property line, but this actu in actuality, their school is another 100 feet away. That's the back end of their St. Gabe's property, I believe. Any questions from the board? I have Mr. a question. Gino? I have a question for Mr. Um, Harris. Let's go with Stephen Harris, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, sir, could, could, you, could you summarize the difference just between a, a club liquor license and a restaurant liquor license, just so we have that distinction. Is there any? There's got to be something. Well, a restaurant is open to the public, and a club is not. That's it. This, that's the distinction is yes. who they serve and what they're open to. Yeah, the, the club is only open to members. So, okay. If I'm, for instance, if if I want to go, I'm I'm not a member of the Knights. They won't let me in. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? How many members do you have, gentlemen? Currently, I think we have um, 420, 420 members. But a lot of them are out of state. A lot of them are elderly in Florida and other states. They stay active just by their dues. So actively, I'd say two, two in the twos. Yeah, Mr. Harris, if, if there was already a liquor license at this location, then isn't it already part of the parcel? No, it's a uh, in, in Milford, these are treated as, as separate and new applications. Any other questions? Is there anybody here who'd like to speak in uh, opposition to this uh, application? 
Okay, seeing none, anybody here would like to speak in uh, favor of this application? Seeing none, uh, this hearing is closed. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Oh, well, for discussion? Yeah, I don't have a problem with this. I don't have a problem either. It was a restaurant and now it's a club. It seems even more confined if that's the issue with it being close to the school, then it's better than it was. I will miss Aldario's, but uh, I don't have a problem with this either. <laughs> we need a motion. Make a motion to approve. Second. Uh, approval is based on the survey presented before us and um, the fact that there was a liquor license already at this premises previously and the distance was already accounted for. I uh, can I have a vote, Doug? With the motion. Have you seen it? With the motion. Front. With the motion. Mr. Dubois? With the motion. The motion it passes unanimously. Item number six, 20 uh, uh, Cooper Avenue, zone R5, John Cas... Cas... I'm not going to... You want to help me with that? Casumpus. Casumpus, thank you. Uh, agent for uh, Gail Trez, Jack Trez, owners, uh, section 3-1-4-1, very northwest side yard set back to 4.1 feet, where 10 feet required. 4.1.4 east side yard projection to 5.5 feet where 8 feet permitted for deck stairs on new single family home. Map 22 block 459 parcel 8. Go ahead sir. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lou Maldonado and I'm with Lothrop Associates, one of the architects out of uh, 100 Pearl Street in Hartford, Connecticut. I'm here on behalf of our clients, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Trez. Um, under the uh, State of Connecticut Department of Housing Hurricane uh, Sandy Relief Program. I do have the affidavit, um, the mailings and photographs of the posting. Presently, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Trez own the uh, house over in 20 Cooper. House was built back in 1935. Um, during Hurricane Sandy, the house was damaged uh, beyond repair. Uh, and what we're looking to do is demolish the house and construct a brand new house. Um, the house will comply with uh, front uh, setback, rear setbacks, um, and one uh, side yard. Um, we're looking to get relief on the western side of the property by four and a half feet. I'm sorry, five and a half feet. Um, and we're gonna have a 12 foot rear deck and we're also looking to get relief on five and a half where eight feet is permitted. Okay, any questions for this gentleman? Uh, what's this, is this the same footprint? It's the same footprint, footprint, yes. Okay. Other than the new rear deck, it's, the house is the same footprint. And we're also pushing it back. We're, we're uh, going to maintain the required 20-foot uh, front yard. And you'll have parking underneath? There will be parking underneath, yes, and parking in the driveway. You've got almost five on each side, so that looks good. Anyone else speaking in favor of this application? Anyone here opposed to this application? Any more questions? No? Okay. This hearing's closed. Thank you. We'll have an answer for you shortly. Um, looks good. It's a 20-foot house. I don't know if, if 
you've been down on that street, there's been a lot of improvements on that street. A lot of nice looking houses on that street. They're really doing, they're fitting in well. It's a good, it looks good. So I think this will fit in well. We need a motion. I make a motion to approve. Second. Approval is based on uh, the narrowness of the lot, the hardship, and uh, the survey presented to be built to the survey presented. We have a motion to approve. We have a second on the motion. Mr. Soda. With the motion. Mr. Mr. Vecino. With the motion. Mr. Haberman. With the motion. Ms. Ferranti. With the motion. I'm with the motion. It's approved. Thank you very much. Item number seven, 162 Beach Avenue, zone R5, Joseph Kubik, Esquire, for David Yannick, owner, section 4-1-4, very projections of 5.5 feet were eight feet permitted to construct a carport. Map 60, block four, 740, parcel 23. Good evening, members of the board, and congratulations, Mr. Chairman. I, I well, maybe our condolences, whichever way it goes, but it's it's always a tough job to be sitting in a chair seat. Uh, so far, you like it, yeah. So uh, my name is Joe Kubik. I'm a lawyer with Harlow Adams and Friedman here in town, and I'm representing David Yannick, the owner of 162 Beach Avenue. Uh, and Dave's not here. Dave is control controller of the city of Stamford and had a meeting he had to attend. He's trying to get back. Um, I'm still hoping he's gonna walk through that door, but in any event, I'd like to proceed, certainly. And this is Dave's application uh, for variance at 162 Beach Avenue. Certificates have already been submitted with the affidavit. And this is an application to vary 4.1.4 of the regs projections into side yard. And the sole purpose is so that, so that Dave can construct a one car covered parking area, carport. Uh, the property is located in an R5 zone, and I've given, submitted a handout with some exhibits just to help go through this quickly and give you a quick history of the lot. Dave bought this property uh, this summer, and the deed is Exhibit A, and he bought Lot 21 that's shown on his own on a map that is Exhibit B, and the second page of Exhibit B is, shows Lot 21. It's a 40 by 100 foot lot, so it's um, <clears throat> a lot that was created in 1925. So it's a legally non-conforming lot. Um, and on to exhibit C, the assessor's card. The card lists that the house built was built back in 1925. There were some additions, but additions subsequent, but it was hard to get the dates on those additions. But it was subsequent to 1925, certainly. And that's exhibit C. And Dave bought the house from Angel estate of Angelina Schneider. And I had the uh, great fortune to be able to represent Angelina and her husband while they were with us. And the Schneiders owned that property since 1961. Uh, and it was an interesting story that they didn't think much of. They were U Ukrainian immigrants. Um, but the story was that Babe Ruth's girlfriend used to live in this house. And again, they didn't think much of it and didn't follow up on it because they weren't, they weren't big baseball fans. Well, <clears throat> some of us are, and we find the whole story fascinating. But that's a side note. Dave, what Dave's trying to do with his house, and he, and he loves the history of it already, is um, he, start, he came to and he wanted to reconstruct a front porch and a uh, carport. And he did, a get, uh, he did get zoning approvals to construct a uh, front porch, which meets the requirements of projections into a setback. And he got uh, a, an approval to construct a carport. And he went ahead um, and, to, and to keep that carport within the projections allowed by the regulations. And so he went ahead and he started to do the work and he, he got the driveway prepared and he had the, the, the uh, posts, put, started to put the posts up, the pillars up, and then it became painfully obvious that it was totally impractical, that you couldn't put a car between the posts and the house and open up the doors. It was, it was pointless. So the decision was, well, we're going to have to go back and try for a variance, and that's why we're here. <clears throat> and so Dave's, what Dave is doing is constructing, requesting a functional carport for one, for one car for a covered parking on his, on his property. Exhibit D is um, the plot plan in highlight showing the carport blown up. So you can easily see that. I know that the plans we gave you are the that small version that I know the, administrator, the administrative office likes. Uh, but that shows a 12 by 20 foot carport. 12 by 20 foot is about, the si is typically the size of a single car garage. Your zoning regulations 
call for a minimum parking lot in a, in a parking space in, in, in any type of a shopping center is being 9 by 18 minimum. 9 by 18 means that you've got spots on both sides so you can op open up your car doors. That's why single car garages are typically about 12 feet wide. Any narrower doesn't work. So we're using that as the size of a functioning, as small as possible, single car covered storage area. Now, we go on to, and that, this shows the setbacks. You can see that we're only, we're, we're seeking a projection into the um, setback of an additional 2.5 feet that we aren't at, 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 entitled to as of right, leaving 5.5 feet to the property line. I think that's a significant number, and I'll explain that to you a little bit later, um, very shortly later. Exhibit uh, E is a GIS map showing um, 162 Beach Avenue highlighted. You can see the uh, other properties on that GS map in the immediate vicinity. Some have garages. One thing to note is the distance between 162 um, Beach Avenue and 160 Beach Avenue is a, a little bit bigger than most of the uh, other distances between the properties. I'd also like to point out the oversize. Some of the outside lots that are a bit larger than the original 40 by 100, I'm not sure how those happened over the years, but some of the lots are larger in the neighborhood. And again, we, we try to point with G's, with G's written on the pages, so what we determined were garages and the rare properties. And then some quick, some photographs, Exhibit F is looking at the property as it is right now, today. And you can see uh, the White House, of course, is at 162. The house to the right is 160 Beach Avenue. Dave, my client, Dave Yannick, owns both properties. And you can see the, uh, the pretty wide gap between the properties. You also see where they started working on the front porch, which they have as of right. And then you'll see between the houses what looks like a pillar, and we're going to see some more photographs of that. You go to exhibit G. Well, there's the sign that was posted, um, timely. You'll see the pillars that were installed by uh, the contractor. And um, the driveway that had always been a driveway, asphalt paved driveway, that was, they dug it out to remove the old asphalt so they could lay in a new, uh, new pavement. Exhibit uh, H is looking from the center between the two properties back to the rear property line. Not as significant, but that's the rear of the property um, and showing the driveway leading into the rear of the property. And then the last photograph is Exhibit I, looking from the rear of the property out to the street. And again, you can clearly now see these pillars that the contractor put in there. The full intent was to do it to try to make it work, and they realize this is just totally not functional. And across the street, you'll see 161 Beach Avenue, which I think is significant because within the last four years, that addition with the two-car garage was installed in that lot with a variance on the other side of the property. Now, <clears throat> that's going through the photographs uh, quickly in the exhibits. <coughs> um, the, what we want to build is an elevation, which the elevations are shown, um, exhibit J. Uh, the front of the house with the, the new porch that is as of right, stonework on the bottom with a carport with some stone pillars. The idea is to really clean up this asphalt shingled, I'm not asphalt, asbestos shingled house that obviously needs some, some attention and make it an attractive part of the neighborhood. Exhibit K is a side view showing what this is likely to look like um, from, from 160 uh, Beach Avenue. Um, and what you might see uh, looking into the property from the road, it's open, it's designed to be open, it's a carport. Uh, not a garage. Now, one of the things I, I, I thought was interesting, and I, we were playing around with, gee, Dave, maybe you could put parking somewhere else in this property, covered parking. So I took a 12 by 20 uh, rectangle and I put it around the back of the property. And the only place that it could possibly be close to fitting is in um, Exhibit L. You'll see that rectangle with the red X in it. And that red X is, uh, that, that rectangle is four feet off the side yard, which is as of right for accessory building, and five feet from the rear lot, which is as of right for an accessory building, but it's less than, clearly less than eight feet from the house, the structure, which violates at least that regulation. No way you could put a garage in without getting a variance, and we, we would contend that the, the, the impact on the, on the neighbor, neighboring properties is much more extreme. What's also I thought was significant is I could put a garage four feet for the property line, but an open carport, you can't. And I, we think that that application, that reg to this, this application, we don't think is really necessary for the, uh, the purposes of the regulations. So 
obviously I don't need to tell the board the powers and as far as, as, far as um, varying regs, but you know, we're, we're taking the, we take the position that this is, you know, due concern for public health, safety, convenience, and so forth can be taken into account. We think this is an improvement for the neighborhood. Dave can't do this any other way, a covered parking for inclement weather. Uh, can you hear it? It's getting a little older. And so um, having, the, having the ability to have a car covered would be nice. Um, point is, that he, he can't do it any other, way, any other ways with the property because of the size of the property, the position of the, of the house, and we don't believe that this request negatively impacts the uh, regulations, and we believe this is the, the minimum variance necessary for a functional covered parking on this property. And I would request that uh, the, the board grant the variance, and I'm here for questions. Do you have a question, Mr. Haberman? Yeah, are you going to have gutters on this? Are there going to be gutters on this? On the, gutter, the gutters won't extend into the, they can't go any more than the, than the uh, 2.5 okay. feet in, more than the permitted. Yeah, that's been taken into account. Any other questions? Mr. Vizzino? So the pillar that's standing right now, is. are we saying that that pillar is at 8 feet from the adjoining property and that is what that is what it would have looked like if you tried to fit to the setback I, I just didn't really understand this the story how and okay. did did the board understand that's what it is right it's, yeah. that's where it is at that eight feet right and so you tried to put it there and obviously it's too small and that's why you're going out correct right? okay thanks Yeah, I'm just wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on the hardship, because part of the hardship is when there's a lot that's particularly unique in the neighborhood. And in Exhibit E, you're showing us a GIS map that shows identical lots throughout the neighborhood and near identical placement of a lot of the houses on the lots compared to 162. I agree. A number of the properties are, are similar. In fact, a number of the properties are from that original uh, subdivision map from 1925. One of the dis dis distinct differences is that there's no, no ability to put a covered parking in the rear of the property because of the building structure itself extends back, eliminating that space where other properties have that ability. Any other questions? Anyone else speaking in favor? this application? Anyone opposed to this application? Okay, we're all set. This hearing's closed. Thank you. Um, I think it looks good. I think it's an improvement. Um, your thoughts? Have any problem with it? It's not enclosed, and it, it, so it's open. Um, it, uh, I think, it, it, it's a nice-looking addition to the house. Go ahead, Mr. Soda. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a problem with this either. Thank you. We need a motion. Make a motion to approve. Second. Reason for the approval, and one of the hardships is uh, the placement of the house on the lot. It doesn't allow to place a make a garage anywhere else, and for the other reasons noted in the uh, uh, survey provided. The motion to approve. We have a second on the motion. Ms. Ferranti? With the motion. Mr. Habman? With the motion. Mr. Vecino? With the motion. Mr. Soda? With the motion. I'm with the motion. It's approved. Uh, let's see. Old Business, 12 Fran Street. Um, I know this is just for a vote. We need some time to possibly yes, Mr. review Mr. this. Pardon? This is just for a vote, and we're trying maybe just to refresh our memory. Yes, this is a voting. It's a voting item only. Um, because it was an appeal taken of my order, and because the public hearing is now closed, I cannot, well, I can't say anything of substance anyway, and I can't introduce any new material, but you can certainly peruse the file, um, bring yourself up to speed. Uh, maybe if you wanted to just review the order, that, I'll leave that up to you. What do you, what do you think? Is this, do you, do you want to, 
Yeah. In a couple of months. Do you have any notes that that we? I can't offer up any. Well, how, how will we public go hearing is closed? Stephen, didn't you make a copy of the uh, the order or no? I did make a copy of the order, but then I remembered that the public hearing was closed and it was an appeal of my order, so it would be inappropriate for me to try and introduce anything. So it, I should just produce the file and they can review it if they want. Reread the minutes. Yeah. Correct, you can. Oh boy. Well, we kind of want to summarize the minutes. We just don't you know, want to go, th go through the whole thing. Okay. Yeah, what are you going to do? Look it up online? I need a minute to find the area in the file from December, I think it was. Hold on, please. Um, this might be a time to take another technical break. Okay. It's been over an hour. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Let's take folks. a break. Technical break. Okay, so we have to officially come back here. So we are, yeah. we are, we are back. Okay, um, for our review, Meg is going to read now I from the hearing. Go ahead. Okay, I have to qualify this. I have on because this laptop, I finalized the minutes on my workstation. Um, these are these are notes I took in real time, most likely. So there may. You know, it may not be the official minutes, and I don't know if you want to. Um, that's going to be. I can read you what I have, and if there's, you know, well, if, if they're on your record, then they're official enough. Aren't they? They're they're close. Okay. I, I, they, I tend to okay. be able to. Um, Mr. Them. Chairman, can we take a five-minute recess? Yes. Okay. Okay, we're we're at we're recessing again. My, my, con my concern is that reading back a summary rather than the actual testimony may unfavorably or favorably prejudice one party or the other because a summary by, by definition is not the complete record. Um, I do have the audio file. The, the trick would be I, I'm set up to record, not to Play. So I guess I would need Arnie to help me put it into some sort of broadcast mode. Because they're, they're, I mean, it, this, it, to, to play it back off the speaker, I, we, I guess you could hear it well enough from the laptop if everyone, if all the voting members could hear it, we could play it back in real time. I can even speed it up and Kevin, you'll sound like a chipmunk. So you can stand that. I think that would work. That would be better? Yeah. Okay. All righty then. Meg, would you put the microphone to the speaker? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, we'll that should take another recess for you to get on it. Well, let's, we can just try it. I mean, it's, it's right here. So, that, yeah. Let's make sure that everybody's gathered around so they can all hear. Okay. Let's see. Um, if Arnie wants to send me a text <laughs> let me know he's ready all right yeah he's ready technology is a wonderful thing technology is wonderful he, he just texted me that he can, he's ready to roll here. Okay, and I've just got to find the right audio file. Audio hooking up, I hear. 
look at the date, so I'm just going to make sure I got the right date here. It's November here anyway, Kevin actually. Okay, and I think he was the first item. Yeah, he was. He was so, the first item. Alright, now the trick is... It was no. It was November. November. It's really, it's, it's thrilling. Okay, let me just try this one more time. I, I'm gonna relaunch this application. And there it is. Okay, sorry folks. Got it, what? All right, let's. Okay, we'll do that. <clears throat> I should be playing back right through the, the internal microphone. Have, um, is this connected like a headset or something? That's not a headset. Mm -mm. No, there's something like why it's not launching through actually you know what I'm gonna do hang on let's do this let's try oh wait so I'm not there. all right let me just see it should that's got to be the file that's got to be the file all right now let's I'm gonna try to open it It's on my 
drive anymore. I understand why it's not in this list. Okay, wait, there's nine. Oh, that's like 2013. I don't understand why it's not there. All right, let's try. Let's try to put on the thumb drive. Let's. I'm just, I'm having a hard time getting it playing back off of the, um, the recording software. I'm I can see the file, I just can't get it to uh, play back. Uh, just can try a little bit more here. A few other ideas. So. <laughs> I see. If you I get in anywhere, otherwise we'll pass. We'll pass this tablet around. I think if you just read the minutes and correct it, I think we're good. I just read them. Very good. Well, let's see. Uh, let's. Do, I got one more technical possible save here. So let me. I'm just moving the audio file to the zip, the um, flash drive, and see if I can play it off of that. For some reason, it doesn't want to play on the laptop itself, so let's see if I can open it there. Oh, it's, there it goes. It's really low. See this, John? Yeah. It's, it's a mess. It's what's that? The minutes? Mr. Yes. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, if need be, I can go across the street and grab the file. Huh? Sorry. Um, he's thinking he can go across the street. I, I have the file here. I have the pra the paper file here, but I just can't get the audio. It, the volume is really low. Well, we've all been looking through and reviewing the notes on our. Wait, 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 before we do anything, I have to use the same software to record again. So I've got to, <laughs> I've got to start a new recording. So are we, I'm not getting enough volume out of the speakers in the laptop to play back. My recommendation is to review the paper file. Okay. Um, now I need to relaunch my recording of this session so we don't lose that. So if you bear with me for a moment. So we should take a, we should take a. No, I'm, I'll, I can do that in a minute. Okay. I mean, what I'll do is I'll just dig, the, the file is very big. That, that's the only thing I, that's unfortunate. Um, 
Okay, I think we have a sound recording. Looks like, yeah. <laughs> my technician in the back there. Um, Arnie has a copy of the DVD from November. Do you really? want? Do you want to play that back? Now the yeah. trick. The trick is going to be yeah. we have to be aware here that while this is playing back, it is not recording. So we we don't have a recording of what goes on. That that's that that's not good. Okay. I mean, it has to be recorded. Right. Does he have another device that we can watch it through? The man behind the curtain is being consulted. I don't know if he has. I don't. I. I he has equipment in the in the recording studio, but I don't know that he has a device he could bring out, like a player, a DVD. Oh, my, player. Su uh, my suggestion would be to look through the paper file. Okay. To the extent that everybody, you know, remembers what all the issues were, and then vote accordingly. Did everybody read the minutes? Yes. I'm almost done with them. Sorry. <clears throat> well, I believe most of us, by what we've been waiting, have been reviewing and looking through so we do have a good idea of what took place at that time. Um, so we're at the point of where we would have, we can discuss this. He doesn't have a portable player. Okay, we can discuss this and see what your thoughts might be. Okay, thoughts or comments? Okay. Right, from, good, Mr. Soto. From what I remember is the applicant had gotten all his CAM approval, all his zoning permits, all his building permits. He had gotten the house like 90% completed, and then he got a partial site plan revoked by the zoning office. And then it went through court, and um, I think we're on a time frame now that there was nothing done. Quick enough. Get a, a coastal review or something. They were told they didn't need it, right? And then it subsequently was told they had to have it. Then for right. they, they revoked but I think that, that issue was all resolved in court. And then I think um, no action was taken for seven years or something, from the, what the minutes say. Right, the, 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 the city didn't the act, city, on, it. The and didn't act on it for like six years later. Uh, and that wasn't seen as, that's not a problem because there's really no, you know, it's not nice, but it's not, it's not a problem because there's no time limit uh, in terms of the city acting. Um, I, think, uh, I think they got bad advice uh, and um, uh, 
Well, I know I we're not feel, deciding. I feel bad for him. I, 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 you, know, you feel bad. I mean, that's, you know, I don't, that. The minutes say the court decision was 2012. Yeah. So yeah. there is something about no enforcement action in seven years, so I'm not entirely sure what that discrepancy is. But I think that was from the time the uh, site plan got revoked. But I mean, the site plan was done by a licensed surveyor and, um, you know. And it was approved at the time. And it was approved by the board, correct? But all of this was decided in the court decision, so we're not actually here to debate right, I think what these we're here back to issues. It's the ZEO's enforcement of the court decision, correct? Yes. So what we're deciding, you're either going to uphold the appeal or reverse the appeal. Mr. Harris, if we reverse the appeal, then he, what happens? He gets his CO? Well, all I can say on this is the board is empowered to either uphold the appeal, overturn the appeal, or modify the appeal. And the appeal is to get his CO, correct? I would refer you to the notes. The notes. Ahead, I guess for me, uh, it, it's, it really comes down to whether it, uh, uh, the city, through Mr. Harris, is legally sound in their decision in, the, in being able to uh, uh, cite uh, the violation, uh, you know, make that, uh, the cite the folks. Uh, and uh, even seven years or five years or four years after, after the fact. And there is no time limitation. At least it wasn't established that there's a, there's a time of uh, uh, you know a limitation on time. Uh, so um, to me, it may not be nice. It may not be a good practice, but it's not an illegal practice. And therefore, I, I, he had the city had right to to provide the notice. The city had right to, what? to provide Good, the notice. notice to cite. To issue their uh, uh, the enforcement order. Well, I mean, I've been going through the file, and I don't see anything in here that says there's a statute of limitations for how long they can wait. And I mean, I 
that appears to be the linchpin item that's before us as the board. Yeah, it's confirmed in the November minutes that mm -hmm. there is no right. statute. Yeah. So it appears that we're struggling with just doing what we feel. Um, Do we have the handouts that uh, that's right. provided? Yeah, that's right. These are extra. That's attorney Chris Satan stuff. I'm just, there are some, some um, extra materials from the November meeting that I can, if you want to send some towards Sarah and and Howard, uh, Bill. Did we have a couple of postponements on this? Is that why this got so so far ahead of us? I <laughs> this happened in November, didn't it? So there have been uh, extensions. We had a couple so of extensions. Have to, have to vote tonight. I know a lot of us can recall what happened, but we're trying to make sure. Okay, we're coming to any con conclusions on this? Ms. Ferranti, you look like you have something to say. I, I think the problem here is we might all be a little hung up on the merits of this issue at large. Um, and what we have to remember is that's not what we're here to discuss. The courts already debated that. Uh, that's out of our hands. What we're here to look at is as a result of the court decision and Mr. Harris's ensuing actions are all those right and just. Well, I think we're all struggling with the court order. That, you know, uh, that, that's what we're looking at in the decision. <clears throat> so again, it's uphold the appeal or
Unless there's a statute of limitations on whether or not when uh, a uh, the zoning enforcement officer can, uh, uh, you know, give that order, uh, 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 I don't see how you overturn. Uh, it may not. Again, it, you know, waiting you know, from 2012 when the the, the court had uh, given its ruling till 2015 to to to, to do the order. You know, that's, if I'm not right, but uh, I don't know why it took that long, but, you know, it wasn't legal. It wasn't illegal, so. Yeah, I, I make a motion to uphold the, the decision of the zoning enforcement law. Second. Okay, we have a motion to uphold the zoning officer's decision. We have a second on the motion. Ms. Ferranti? With the motion. Mr. Habman? With the motion. Mr. Soda? Uh, with the motion. Mr. Vecino? With the motion. I'm with the motion. The decision upheld. Okay, finally, moving on. Uh, new business? Mr. Mr. Harris, you have any new business for us? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Actually, I have new business. I have the feeling that I'm forgetting something besides this, but there's uh, I have handouts for everyone um, reflecting new uh, regulations that have been uh, adopted by the planning and zoning boards for everybody's right books. So before you leave, don't leave without those, please. And it seems like there was something else. Say it again. Section 317 something something. Okay, under new business, so we have new uh, new appointees again. Mr. Vecino has been reappointed for five years, uh, and Mr. Dubois has been reappointed as a alternate. alternate for the next five years. So that's something under new business. So there's staff update. Anything on staff update? Uh, it's not really a staff update. I do have a decision for 35 Thompson that you guys could read, the Simcoe decision. Let me just, I'll just pass it out. Yeah, why don't you pass it around? Someone will take it home and read it. So. Okay, uh, acceptance for the minutes, December 8th, 2015. Was there an, was an, er an error in the minutes, Meg? There was an error somewhere, wasn't there? There was a Scrivener's error, but I can, yeah, I can't, I can't remember what it was. I sent. Does anybody have their emails that they can yeah. from me? Because I just, I, I, it was. There was something that uh, that Bill said <laughs> that I've actually corrected online, I think. But there was something okay. else. <laughs> Do we have to look into it? Was it correct? If you think you, it was corrected. If somebody can we'll, find the email that I okay. sent to the board, like that's oh, I identified it. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're we're accepting the minutes for December. Yeah. All in favor? As corrected. As Aye. amended. It's been corrected. Aye. Okay. <laughs> Applications for next month? I think so. No? Light month? Okay. I think so. I will not be here. Oh, okay. We have Howard, no holdovers though. Nothing's <laughs> coming back again. That's good. What? We have no holdovers, so nothing's coming back. That for the first time in a long time. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is oh, adjourned. Oh yeah, it's for 108 Beach Avenue. Here's the email I sent you.